Travel in Little Shorts and this is Purple Perseverance and Me. Purple is my favourite colour. I've just always been drawn to it. Anytime I see something purple, I always look for it. So now everything I buy near enough. Generally when I'm running, I'm always wearing something purple. So like this top, this long sleeve top. My headbands are always purple. If I go and buy anything new, it's always going to be purple. But yeah, it's just a royal regal colour. It's a warm colour and it's a cool colour all in one. I pride myself in running loads of races. I run for the bling. As you know, I've got about 120 or so odd races that I've run. Some of them, are, they didn't have medals, so it's probably more than that. But the main ones that I pride myself with are these three. They are full marathon medals, which is 26.2 miles or 42 kilometers. My very first marathon was back in 2015 when I lived in Ottawa. So it was my very first one. So that was my greatest achievement because it's the first time I ever run this far and I finished it and I was so happy. And then my next one is my Manchester Marathon. So I moved back to England by this stage. I think this was in 2018, yes, 2018. And it was my fastest marathon in the time of four hours and 29 minutes. And I love that. So this is why it's my pride and joy. And then this one is the London Marathon. So it's the first time I actually got into London it was last year, but of course with COVID, it couldn't happen. So we ran it virtually. So. Um, this is the virtual marathon medal. So as I was saying, this is my certificate for being officially amazing. <laughs> and it's the Guinness World Records official participant. And that shows you that I am a title holder for running London Marathon in 2020 virtually. So I'm really happy. So it basically says participating in the following record event, the most users to complete a remote marathon in 24 hours is 37,966 9, 37, and was achieved by the Virgin Money London Marathon in the UK on the 4th of October 2010. So before I started running, I did hardly did any kind of exercise at all. I like my food a lot. I'm a carb addict, hashtag carb addict. I love carbs so much and that's probably why I put on so much weight in the past. And I actually started doing some form of exercise when I moved to Canada because everybody seemed to do something, some form of exercise. Not necessarily running at the time, it was long walks or um, I joined a volleyball team. And that really showed that how unfit I was. And so after that, I started doing longer walks, six to six miles to say 10 miles. I started doing that. And then I found running. So then I started doing the Couch to 5K program, which allows you to start a running and then walking in intervals. And they do that for over an eight week period. And by the end of that eight week period, you're supposed to be able to run 5K in 30 minutes. But I was able to do a whole 5K without stopping by the end of it. And uh, my first race was a week after I finished that plan. And that made me fall in love with running. But I originally actually started doing exercise because I was getting to the age where um, my mum died early. She died at 47 and I was getting to the point where if I didn't do something about my weight, I would end up dying early as well. So when I turned 40 was when I actually started looking at exercise and then um, didn't look at my food straight away. <laughs> that happened later on. but just started looking at my exercise and trying to lose weight and things like that. So the reason why I um, ran lots of races was I needed something to keep me running. So that's why I actually did a lot of 5Ks in the early days. And then they built up to 10Ks, then to half marathons, and then to the first marathon in Ottawa. And then later on, I, um, I tried so many diets over the years, and then I found keto in 2017. And after I started that, within four, I think six months, I got to my goal. So I lost um, 35 pounds, about four stone, three and a half stone. And um, that kicked up my, my speed because I wasn't carrying so much when I was running. And then the year later, that's when I did Manchester Marathon and ran my fastest marathon. I would say that before running, 
I did, I used to be a consultant where I traveled around, not just the UK, but Europe. But I was always on my own on these, these projects. And I ended up, and I was so shy and I didn't want to do anything. So the only thing I could do was go to restaurants or go and sit in a cinema and eat popcorn and stuff. <laughs> so I ended up eating and doing things on my own. And I so wish that I had running before because even that would allow me to explore these places that I was going to. So that would have been good. But um, so when I started running, it made me more confident in exploring the areas that I went to. Um, and then starting Park Run and my running club, I met so many good friends there and um, went out much more normally running holidays though <laughs> but still exploring and it's also made me confident and like um going out on trails on your own makes you confident that you can do things on your own and then also achieving a marathon and following a plan just makes you think you can achieve anything from not running to doing a marathon and completing it just shows that you can do anything in your life if you a plan to it, follow that structure and complete that goal. I look to Ron Hill as an inspiration to maintain my own run streak. I'm still in awe of his 52 odd years of his own run streak, which is still the longest ever. That's an amazing achievement and I only hope I can get slightly close to that. I'm also amazed by his own brilliant running career, running in two Olympics and winning Boston. That's one race I can only dream of even entering, but yeah, amazing runner. He also had a huge hand in shaping how running gear is today. So the technical tops, air wicking tops, things like that. I believe he had a, a huge input into how they came about. So that's incredible too, amazing. Ron had this little business in Hyde. It was basically a retail store with uh, a bit of mail order. Yeah. And he was looking for a personal assistant. So I applied for the job because I just thought I was bored stiff. Um, and I didn't get the job because he was, to make ends meet, he was flying over the pond to America every month to run a marathon to, to earn a thousand dollars. was the first guy to bring Nike into, the, into Europe. So when he's in America, he met the guys who'd started the Nike business in the 70s. So he had the Nike franchise, if you like, and we were selling it to people like Sweatshop down in Teddington that was started by Chris Brasher, who did the marathon, and latterly run by Hugh Brasher, who's now the race director there. Um, so yeah, we, you know, I think he was one of those things, he just thought, I'm not going to miss a day's training. I'm going to be better, you know, he's probably had a bad r run somewhere. Yeah. and thought you know right i'm gonna go and get have a few beers tonight and i'll take the day off tomorrow and there was a point when he just thought if i'm gonna make it i've got to commit and that commitment in the early days was twice a day and once on sundays it's fascinating when i look at someone like ron as an individual you know i mean so understated uh and yet there's a bit of a ruthless streak if you're going to be that successful you know you've got to be fairly sort of selfish you know like even though he had a young family and he was working, he was running to and from work every day. But, you know, when you look back and think he was self-coached, he was never any great shakes as a youth or a junior. It was only when he got to university that he started to probably train properly and have the influence of other runners around him who were better uh, and worked it out himself. And then, you know, but he was self-coached, self-trained all the way through. Um, he started experimenting with a carbohydrate loading diet for his marathons where you'd sort of only eat protein for the first three days. If you ever get the chance to sort of look him up and look at what he did, um, you know, considering it's 50 years ago, um, you know, he's still, the times he's running now, he'd still be right up there with the best that we've got. I mean, the only guy who could, you know, get away from him over the marathon distance would be someone like Mo Farah. Um, and again, as people are talking these days about these new shoes with the springs in from Nike and Addy and stuff, you know, I think I think with the uh, with the technological advancements of the last 50 years and, you know, some sort of medical backup and maybe somebody in the background giving him a bit of um, advice, you know, I think he overtrained. He used to race every week because he just loved it. That was the reason, you know, 
when Saturday comes, it was all about racing. But I don't remember him for the streak and that. I just think about a guy who was the best in the world for a time at his chosen uh, subject, you know, 10,000 metres marathon cross country. Uh, and also then, you know, you think about a guy who set up a little fledgling clothing brand, you know, there wasn't any decent clothing. So he got a pair of shorts and ripped the sides and created this thing called a freedom short with a wrap over a mesh vest so you could breathe better. And he was a textile chemist. So he started bringing technical fabrics in. He was the first person to use Gore-Tex in wing suits, you know? So all that other stuff that goes into the business when I met him from the ages of say 40 through to 60, you know? Um, and then he created the Hilly Socks business when we sold the Ron Hill business. So, you know, there's a hell of a life there and it isn't just the running stuff. And it certainly isn't just the streak. <laughs>